Hi everybody! We are going to do a two video series on venipuncture, so what the procedure is for venipuncture. Part one is going to be about preparing the patient and then part two is going to be about venipuncture. So first let's talk about the test requisition. The minimum information that needs to be on the test requisition is going to be your patient demographics including their full name, date of birth, sex, race, for inpatients, they also need their hospital ID number, their room and bed number, and then it should be a name or a code for the physician making the request, and of course, the tests that are requested. Also, the test status, is it a short turnaround time test or STAT test? Is it timed? Is it fasting? Or is it just a routine test? Uh, the requisition allows you to identify the patient correctly and may provide helpful information. Some hospitals will have the, the test, but also the tube that you need to draw to have for that test. So it, that's very helpful if you can't remember which test goes into what tube. Um, and uh, it also allows you to gather, all, obviously, all the necessary equipment for the collection before you even encounter the patient. So if there's any kind of special test that's ordered, you can make sure that you have the right collection tubes uh, before you present yourself to the patient if you review your test requisition thoroughly. So uh, I'm going to list the steps of routine venipuncture, and we're going to cover about half of them in this video and the other half in the next video. So the steps are to greet and identify the patient, to position and prepare the patient, to perform hand hygiene and put on clothes, apply the tourniquet, select the site for venipuncture, palpate the vein, clean the site, assemble the equipment, reapply the tourniquet if you've taken it off, um, examine the needle, perform the venipuncture, fill the first tube, and then advance and change the tubes if you need several tubes, remove the tourniquet, prepare for needle removal, withdraw the needle, dispose of the entire used needle collection system in the Sharps collection container, label your tubes, attend to the patient, and deliver the specimen to the lab. So let's start with inpatient requisitions. So you need to make sure you examine them to make sure it has all the necessary information, so the full name, date of birth, ordering position, patient location, and the test. Check for duplicates. So um, duplicates that are commonly seen would be an order for a hemoglobin hematocrit and an order for a CBC. Well, a CBC contains a hemoglobin and hematocrit. And um, an order for maybe a potassium or a potassium and magnesium and a basic metabolic panel. The basic metabolic panel has a potassium in it also. So these are pretty typical duplicates. And um, you want to group multiple requisitions on the same patient because you don't want to have to go back and stick them unnecessarily. Um, and you do want to pay attention to obviously what's on your requisitions. Um, sometimes you do have to come back and stick patients because there are certain time draws and the timing needs to be respected. But as much as you possibly can, you really should try to group things so that you don't um, stick your patient constantly. Uh, you need to prioritize your requisitions. Um, so this is if you, especially if you're going to go draw maybe several patients or if you have several requisitions that you're dealing with, stats come first, time collections would be next as long as you're trying to be like within the right time frame. Um, most hospitals have a 30 minute window around the, the time that the specimen needs to be collected. Of course, as close as you can to the correct collection time is best. Routine uh, tests can be delayed if needed. They can be um, grouped with the next time collection. They can be grouped with a stat if needed. And uh, obviously then collect all the equipment that you will need for the collections that you are going to perform. We do need to take a, a side note here, sidestep, and talk about the advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage. Um, so sometimes a patient that's covered by Medicare may request a service that is not eligible for reimbursement. 
then the patient must sign an advance beneficiary notice of non-coverage. So this is typical for, this is for the US. Um, if you're in a different country, you may have something similar. Uh, and it shows that the patient understands that the service may not be reimbursed. Uh, and it must be presented to the patient far enough in advance of the service so that they can make the decision whether or not they want that service. Don't give that to them after you've stuck them if they decide they don't want it because they can't afford it. Next is patient identification. So this is a critical step. You need to correctly identify the patient. It is absolutely the most important step in any phlebotomy procedure. When blood is drawn from the wrong patient, the test results for that blood will be attributed to the wrong person. This could have profound consequences. The patient may receive an incorrect diagnosis or the wrong treatment, which could result in an injury or even death. If no harm comes to the patient, though, drawing blood from the wrong patient may result in the dismissal of the phlebotomist and the potential for a lawsuit. So all inpatients should be wearing ID bands uh, issued by the hospital. And if they don't, if they're an inpatient and they are not wearing an ID band, then you have the right to request that the um, staff that's caring for that patient um, puts a uh, proper ID band on the patient. So uh, guidelines issued in 2010 by the Joint Commission indicate that at least two patient identifiers must be used to correctly identify a patient for drawing blood. One of the critical steps here is to actually elicit that information from the patient. So you would want to approach the patient and ask them to state their uh, usually name and date of birth. Those are the two identifiers that have been chosen because most people can answer that pretty easily. Um, I will say that if you go into a room and the patient has dementia and you ask them if they're Mr. John Smith, uh, date of birth, whatever, whatever, um, if they have dementia, they're liable to say yes, even if that's not their name. So um, we're going to greet identify the patient. I was already talking about that a little bit, but you do want to knock gently before entering the room. Don't be rude and loud. Announce yourself if a curtain is closed around the bed. And um, say that the physician has ordered the test without discussing specifics. So um, it's really up to the physician to explain why um, and if the patient wants to refuse or if the patient has questions it's best to direct them back to their physician uh, and you do want to identify yourself you, you do want to say hey i'm so and so from the lab i'm here to draw some blood your physician has ordered a few tests and uh, then you want to ask the patient to state his or her full name and full date of birth and then while they say that, you need to be checking the requisitional labels against what the patient is telling you to make sure that it's correct. And then you can also uh, take a look at their ID band to make sure everything is matching. Uh, you can ask the patient if he or she has had blood drawn before. Most of them, it will be a yes, but sometimes it's a no. So next we're gonna position and prepare the patient. So never draw blood from a patient that is sitting on a high stool or that is standing, uh, cause they can pass out, they can fall out on you. Um, outpatients can be seated in a special chair that has arm supports. And for inpatients, you can lower the bed rail for better access or raise it, whichever, if you're really tall, you need to raise the, the, the bed itself and then lower the bed rail, you can do that. Um, you but if you lower a bed rail, then you must remember to raise it again after the procedure, especially if you see signs in the room where the patient is, is a fall risk. Because if you leave that bed rail lowered, then they may try to get out of bed without help and fall and break a hip or something. You do want to support the arm for venipuncture under the elbow. A pillow is very easy to use to that for that. Uh, and um, you want to ask the patient to remove foreign objects from the mouth, so if they have anything in their mouth, it's probably best to remove that. Explain the procedure, get verbal consent from the patient, um, and explain to the patient that he or she will feel a small poke or pinch and should remain still throughout the collection. You want to perform hand hygiene. 
so you can also do some hand hygiene, if you will, as you're greeting the patient and talking to them, uh, if it's convenient, if the sink is near the patient. So um, once you perform your hand hygiene, you're going to put on gloves. Uh, you want to apply the tourniquet about three to four inches above the puncture site, which is going to usually be the antipubital fossa. So uh, usually if you put the tourniquet around the upper part of their arm, um, they're good. Don't place a tourniquet over an open sore. Don't pinch any IV lines in the tourniquet or anything uh, like that. So be, be mindful of what's there. Um, direct skin contact may be uncomfortable for people with hairy arms, and in this case, you can tie the tourniquet over a shirt sleeve. Um, if the blood pressure cuff is on that arm, you can take the blood pressure cuff off, but then you have to remember to put it back on. So next, we're going to apply the tourniquet. So to apply the tourniquet, you want to hold one free end of the tourniquet close to the patient's arm, and then you're going to pull the tourniquet across around the arm and you're going to cross it over the first end on top of the arm forming an X. You're going to pull the lower side of the tourniquet taut, so you can tighten it some, right, and then grasp the X between the thumb and the forefinger of one hand and with the other hand you're going to tuck the upper strip close to the X by sliding it under the other side from above. And um, both free ends of the tourniquet should be away from puncture sites. So, so the, the, the ears, if you will, of uh, the bunny ears of the tourniquet, if you will, should go up. And it's okay if it flops down. You just don't want it pointing down because then it's just going to be right in your way. So this picture here has uh, the correct um, tie for the tourniquet. You can see that both ends are pointing up toward the patient's shoulder. Uh, and so that means that the tourniquet is away from the puncture site. Uh, so the tourniquet should not be on the arm for longer than a minute. Uh, impro improper tourniquet application can cause hemoconcentration, so that's an increase in the ratio of formed elements to plasma. It can cause hemolysis, which is the destruction of red cells, and that can alter the test results. And it can cause petechiae, which are small red spots on the skin, caused by a tourniquet that is too tight. Uh, so be mindful of that. If it takes you a minute, you know, to find a vein, when you put the tourniquet on, once you found the vein, pop the tourniquet, take it, take it off, to make it loose while you gather your supplies so that blood can recirculate in the patient's arm. Uh, and then, um, you know, before you do the venipuncture, you can reapply the tourniquet. So next you select the best site. So the median cubital vein is the first choice. The median cubital vein is located in the middle of the arm surface. It is large and well anchored and it does not move when the needle is inserted. The cephalic vein is the second choice. That's the one that's on the outer part, the outer edge of the bend of the arm. Um, the access to the cephalic vein can be awkward due to its location on the outer edge of the arm. However, however, it is often the only vein that can be palpated, which is located by touch, in an obese patient. And then the basilic vein is the third choice, and that is a vein that is on the inner side of the arm. Um, blood can also be drawn from wrist and hand veins, um, but you need to use a butterfly uh, needle or winged infusion set to do that. With a smaller needle, um, it makes the draw slower and increases um, the risk of hemolysis, um, but sometimes that's the only choice you have. Next, you're going to palpate the vein. So veins are best located by palpation or feel rather than sight, so you need to train your fingertips to feel for veins. This is especially true uh, for patients that are darker skin tone. So patients that are really fair like I am, very fair complected, a lot of times you can see their veins pretty easily, um, but you know in darker complexions you can't, but you can find them very easily if you train yourself to, to find them by palpation by touch. So you want to gently push up and down with the index finger. This determines the depth, width, and direction of the veins. Um, the index finger seems to be the most sensitive because it's probably the one we use the most to feel things, and so it has uh, the most sensitivity that's been developed. 
Veins will feel spongy, bouncy, and firm. Arteries will pulsate and tendons will feel rigid and they don't spring back. If you have difficulty locating the vein, you can increase the circulation by gently massaging the arm where the vein is locating or by asking the patient to make a fist. Um, remove the tourniquet once you have found a vein and let some of that circulation return, especially if it's taking you time to find a vein. Now, if once you become really uh, comfortable and really good at doing phlebotomy, uh, it is possible to do it all in one go, especially if the patient has good veins where you can get your tourniquet on, tourniquet on find a vein, clean the vein, and start sticking, and there's less than a minute that happens. Um, so it just, but even um, with experience, there are many times when uh, I have taken the tourniquet off after finding the vein so that I can uh, properly gather what I need or reposition a patient or something before I actually do the phlebotomy. All right, that's the first half, and then I'm going to do the other video here in just a second and uh, upload it.